Diagnostic Center. And what we're going to talk about today is I'm just going to give a brief introduction to the study of gnosis. We'll look at some aspects of gnosis, look at some aspects of our own psychology. We'll talk about what it means to study gnosis, the kind of things that we uh, will find useful on this path, that sort of thing. And just a quote to start today's class off, out with, off, out with, if that makes any sense. Tragic is the existence of they who die without having known the purpose of their life. And that's a quote by an individual called Samuel Rior, which is that guy over there on the wall. And he's what we call the uh, father of modern day Gnosis. He didn't invent Gnosis, obviously. He's been around for thousands and thousands of years. But he was an individual responsible for kind of like giving it a jump start, reintroducing Gnosis to the masses. And we'll be talking about him at different points throughout these studies. Uh, when we start asking the question, what is Gnosis? When we look at the, the entomology of the word itself, Gnosis just is simply the Greek word for wisdom. Okay, so Gnosis is simply the Greek word for wisdom, and how would we define wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge obtained through experience, and that's something that we'll explore through the course of today's lecture. What does it mean to have knowledge? What does it mean to, to, to gain this experience? So when we look at the word Gnosis, and, and we find out where it comes from, it's simply the Greek word for wisdom. People often ask, well, is Gnosis some sort of a religion or something like that? Well, not really. Gnosis is just simply the Greek word for wisdom. The quest for Gnosis, the Gnostic path, is simply the search for wisdom, the quest for wisdom. If we say wisdom is knowledge through experience, the next question we'll ask is, well, what, what is knowledge then? Where does that concept really come from? There was a phrase that hung above all the temples in Greece. You may have heard of this before. A phrase that said, nasa te ipsum. So right above walking into the entranceways of all the temples, there was this phrase, nasa te ipsum. When we translate that, we see that it means, man, know thyself. The full extent of the quote is, know thyself, and thou shalt know the universe and the gods. If we wish to understand the macrocosm, the bigger picture of things, that journey begins by understanding who we are, the microcosm. We're just a reflection of something much greater. If we want to understand the universe, the meaning of life, death, and all that kind of stuff, that journey begins with understanding who we are. You know, why are we here? How do we work? Really, what makes us tick? If we truly want to improve our lives, if we want to find inner peace and happiness, we have to begin by closely examining our own psychology. We often seek things to bring us happiness, to bring us peace, that kind of stuff. We often seek things outside of ourselves, which is one of the reasons why societies become as materialistic as it is, right? Why we've got commercials telling us we need new cars, new clothes, why we're constantly searching for material things to improve our life. To a, a very extreme, uh, that's why people end up being addicted to various substances, drugs, alcohol, and that kind of stuff. They're looking for something outside of themselves to bring them this peace and this happiness. They're always looking, but they're never looking in the right place. One of the aspects of this whole concept of seeking knowledge begins with nasate ipsum, know thyself. Really get to know who we are and what makes us tick. We have to discover why we act the way we do, why we think the way we do, where do our emotions come from, where do our thoughts come from, how does the whole psychological process work. That's something that we have to be prepared to do on the Gnostic path. We have to be prepared to take a mirror and hold that mirror up and really study that reflection, really study who we are. Because if we want to know the universe and the gods, if we want to know the macrocosm, the big picture, that begins with studying who we are. That begins with studying the microcosm, the universe that we find within ourselves. Because once we truly understand ourselves and everything contained inside us, then by reflection and extension, we then understand the universe, the gods, and our place in all of that. Another aspect we have to ask ourselves is, do we really want to change? Do we really want to change various aspects of our lives? Enlightenment, truth, Peace, happiness, that's the kind of stuff that never comes from a book. That's something that has to be experienced. Okay, we, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're like me on this path at some point. You've probably you know, read a lot of books, you've been to a lot of websites, you've watched a lot of TV programs. Coming here today is probably one of dozens of lectures that you've attended on various spiritual paths. But in the end, it comes down to experience. In the end, it comes down to what you directly do. This kind of stuff, enlightenment, peace, truth, happiness, that's never going to come from a book. It's never going to come from somebody else. It's not one of the cases of you know finding the right book or attending the right lecture. That's something we have to experience directly for ourselves. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. What happens if you experience before you read the book? And it doesn't matter. You don't need the book. <laughs> 
yeah, in the end you don't need the book, in the end it's the experience that's important. And that's why we look at great masters, when we look at other awakened individuals, when we look at people like, say, Jesus Christ or, or people like Buddha, uh, they were asked by their disciples, you know, Master, what is the truth? And in that situation, uh, when Jesus was asked, Master, what is the truth? He simply turned around and walked away. When Buddha was asked by his disciples, Master, tell us the truth, would have just stood there and remained silent. What these great masters were telling us is that's something that we can't be told. That's something that we have to experience directly. You know, the truth, inner peace, happiness, that's something that can't be explained to you. That's something that somebody else can't do for you. That's also something that you can't buy. These are things that we have to experience directly by walking a particular path by working on particular aspects of our psychology, by working with things like meditation, astral projection, that kind of stuff. It's through those methods that we arrive at an experience where we get to comprehend firsthand the meaning of our life, the truth, who we are, what makes us tick, all that sort of thing. The process of change and improvement, it's not a passive process. It's not going to happen just simply because we watch a few television programs. It's not going to happen simply because we attend a lecture or we read a book. Change itself is not a passive process, but an active one that's based on knowledge obtained through direct experience. Okay, it's the direct experience that allows us to change our outlook on various aspects of our life. It's directly experienced various elements of our own psychology that allow us to eliminate some of the obstacles that exist to that peace, to that happiness. Okay, we learn to eliminate things like anger and fear and guilt. Those are the things that are obstacles to that inner peace, to that inner happiness. They're not going to magically disappear one day because we read a couple chapters in a book or listen to some guy speak or some uh, lady speak at a lecture. These are things that we have to directly work on ourselves. It's us that has to remove these obstacles to that experience of the truth, to that peace, to that awakening of consciousness. It's unfortunate that most people that walk this planet, they will never know their own situation of life. They are unaware of their fate and they're unaware of their true identity. You've probably encountered this concept before in various spiritual schools or different paths or avenues to enlightenment, but really everything that we find in the physical world, it just acts as a distraction. All these things like jobs and cars and you know houses and possessions and money and stuff, all of that, in the end, for a lot of people, becomes a distraction. They get caught up in the distraction, and they lose their path. They lose their course in life. They get caught up in all those materialistic things, and they're never really able to discover who they are, why they're here, and what their purpose in life is. And that's one of the aspects of walking the Gnostic path, is to answer those questions. Who are we? Why are we here? What are we here for? And really, what are we going to do in this life? What are we going to accomplish? Other people, though, probably, I'm going to guess, everyone in this room have an inner urge. There's a push that comes from somewhere inside you to seek a spiritual path. It's not that you're, you know, it's not that you can't manage life. It's not that you're not happy with life. It's nothing like that. It's just, you know, there's something else more. There's something else to life. It doesn't mean that you're, you know, uh, uh, having a hard time or depressed or angry. You can have a great life and a nice job and a great family and all that kind of stuff. But you know deep inside something's telling you, something's pushing you and has been pushing you for a very long time that this is not all there is to life. You look outside on a nice day and you can be in a good mood or you can be in a bad mood. But you look out on the street, you look at people and everything else, and you think, you know, there's something else. Life is not just simply, you know, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, and spring, summer, fall, winter, and this constant cycle. There's something else behind the scenes here. What I'm going to call an almost instinctive knowledge that there's something more to life. And it's probably been with you since a really early age. Perhaps you've had a few experiences as well that have made you think, you know what? There's more to life than meets the eye. There's more to life than most people are really aware of. There's a huge bulk of humanity that walks around basically in a daydream, living that nine to five life or whatever they are, concerned with their houses and their relationships with their cars and their trucks and all that kind of stuff or whatever. But for some of us, there's something else that's there, something else that's always been there, that's been telling us that there's something we have to find. It's almost like a riddle that we have to get to the answer. The search for a spiritual path and the search for inner change comes from within a person, from the divine spark that we all carry inside of us. Basically, we're all like a, a drop taken from a large, great ocean. Or you can also perhaps think of it, we're all like a tiny grain of sand that has been taken from a large beach. There's a part of something much greater that we find inside all of us. 
The Christians had a concept for that. They called it the soul. We're talking about something similar here. There's a, some source of all things, whether you want to call that God, whether you want to call that Allah, whether you want to call it the illuminated void, whether you want to call it the Zen, whether you, it doesn't matter what you call it. There's a source of all things, a source of all energy in the universe, and we're a part of that. We've been plucked from that great ocean or that great beach, and we're sitting here, and inside of us is a piece that yearns to be back with the whole. There's a piece of us that yearns to merge back with the source of all things. If you want to think of that piece as the soul, if you want to think of the source of all things as God, that's fine. But there's a lot of different ways of looking at it, and every basic religion or spiritual path expresses that same principle. That contained within us is a part of something much greater, and the process of life and death is just a journey of that peace, that divine spark, and its attempt to reunite back with that source. Another question I'm going to pose here, and this is a kind of a, a bit of a, a, almost a controversial thing, this is a bit of a shocking thing to say, but it's a simple question, are we in control of our lives? You stop any person on the street and you say, are you in control of their life, and you're going to get, well, of course I am, I'm a grown person, I have, you know, my job, I have resources, I have a house, I have a car, I have a relationship, whatever. You talk to any adult person and say, are you in control of your life? You're going to get a resounding, definitive, yes, of course I am. I might not be happy with all of it, but I'm definitely in control of most aspects of our lives. Well, what I'm going to suggest here is actually the exact opposite. If we truly reflect on things, if you look across the course of our life, what we discover is we're like a small ship tossed about in a large stormy ocean. Ship ocean, like a picture? Yeah. Yeah. We're a small ship tossed about in a large stormy ocean, where in the end, it's not the ship that directs its own course, but it's the wind and the waves. As we try to navigate this ship of our life, what we find is many times we're steered off course by external factors. Just like that ship wants to sail from one continent to the other, the wind and the waves are constantly acting on that ship, so instead of going in a straight line, that ship's veering all over the place. That's what we really find with a lot of the aspects of our life. We were born with a purpose, a destiny, something to accomplish. All we have to do is get from point A to point B. But sometimes we get veered off course and we go way off course and then we try to get back on course again, but now we're pushed the other direction. Sometimes we never ever get back on course again. Sometimes we spend our whole life trying to find what that original course was. We're like a small ship tossed about in a large stormy ocean. In the end, all we have is the illusion of control. But in reality, it's the wind and the waves. External factors in our life, things like emotions and thoughts that are, come from a different place, they're what steer the ship of our life. In the end, and this is a kind of a, a bold thing to say, and it's not a very pleasant one, in the end we have no control. What we become is simply reactive animals. We simply react to the circumstances in life. And that's a pretty bold thing to say. But when we think about it, we start to behave, and when we really study our psychology, which we'll look at over the next few weeks, we behave in many aspects like programmed robots than individuals. And that's a shocking thing to say, but right now, if I wanted to make you feel good, I'd give you a compliment. I'd say, I really like your shirt, I really like your hair, I really like what you've done, and that would make you feel good. Perhaps you'd you know, feel happy, you'd feel proud, that kind of thing. But I could also do the opposite. If I wanted to make you feel bad, I could insult you. I could make fun of you. I could say something negative to you that would create a reaction. Whether you had a good day today or a bad day today probably depended on who you were with. Who were, did you spend your time with? Who did you run into? If you had a good time with perhaps some people that you really enjoy spending time with, friends or family, that would make you feel happy. The reaction to that situation would be a positive reaction. But perhaps if you had a problem with a, a, you know, a salesman or a, a, a perhaps a co-worker or a management or something that something happened at work where you didn't really get along with somebody, that would have then created a different reaction. One of perhaps anger or frustration or you know, fear of losing your job or something like that. So whether we're in a good mood or a bad mood largely depends upon who is with us. We have a term for that, right? Pushing each other's buttons? That's where that comes from. Okay, whether you're in a good mood or bad mood right now may depend on whether your spouse or significant other is in a good mood or bad mood today. Because if they are in a bad mood, perhaps that's directed at you, which has put you in a bad mood, and then you directed that to a friend on the phone, and it's kind of like a chain reaction. We're constantly influencing people around us. We do it all the time. 
It's not only other people that influence and control the circumstances of our lives. It's stuff. It's our environment itself. Things like our car. Our car gets a flat. We're angry. We're frustrated. That kind of thing. Our computer crashes at work. That's a source of anger, frustration. Things like money create different sorts of reactions as well. So when we look at the typical day that we have, whether we had a good day or a bad day, the events, the emotions, the thoughts that occur during the day, that's largely dependent upon external factors. For example, people that are depressed. Nobody wants to be depressed, but if you've ever experienced depression, you can't just simply stop it and go, well, I don't want to be depressed anymore. That emotion is a reaction. It comes from somewhere else. Okay, so when we look back at the different states in our life, many times we'll find that the things we do in life from our thoughts to our actions to our emotions are simply a reaction to something external. And if that wasn't the case, then everybody would be happy all the time, right? <coughs> of course we all want to be happy. We'd be happy 24-7 basically because there'd be nothing else to stop that. But it's because of these external factors that we find our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions almost like a roller coaster. We've all been in a situation where we've reacted to somebody with, with anger. And we found ourselves having to apologize, saying things like, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know what I was thinking, uh, I don't know what came over me. So in that situation, that anger was simply a reaction. Something else came into our physical organism, took control of our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions, only to leave later on, leaving us sitting there embarrassed or, or ashamed of our actions and having to apologize and trying to undo the damage that we've done. I'll go even one step further. I'm going to suggest that we don't even have control over our own mind or what we think. And that's something that we could easily illustrate right now. If right now I was to say what we're going to do is go into a meditation. All we're going to do is sit there, close our eyes, and think nothing else but a calm blue lake. That's all we're going to do. We're going to close our eyes, think of nothing else but a calm blue lake. What we'd quickly find is we'd be able to hold that image of that calm blue lake for a couple of seconds maybe before another thought creeps into our mind. Oh, what time is it? We've got to remember to get milk on the way home. Or, geez, what am I going to do this weekend? i got to go grocery shopping and we're going to have that party Saturday night. And, oh, Christmas is coming up. Oh, Christmas, I got, what am I going to get for gifts? Next thing we know, we discover that we're in a constant state of an endless stream of thoughts going through our mind at any given time. Modern psychology tells us that we have, on average, 30 to 40,000 thoughts in a given day. So you're talking multiple thoughts every second streaming through our consciousness. Okay, that's what becomes the winds and the waves that steer the course of our life. And we can't stop those thoughts. That's the whole purpose of meditation. Something else we study in this path and spend a lot of time doing, the whole purpose of meditation is to take control of that intellectual process. To end that endless train of thoughts to discover what else lies behind all of that stuff. Consequently, as a result of that endless stream of thoughts, as a result of all these reactions to people in our environment, we find that we're never in the present moment. The irony of being human is we have this life of whatever, 75 odd years, the irony is we miss all of it. Because we're never in the present moment. You're either always in the future, or you're always in the past. Okay, you're physically here in this room right now, I'm not even paying attention because I said this, but two seconds ago you weren't in this room. Your mind was thinking about something else. You're thinking about a book that you'd read. You're thinking about a TV show that you saw. You're thinking about last weekend, how good it was. Or you're thinking about this upcoming weekend. Or you're thinking about Christmas. The idea being that you're never in the present moment. You're always somewhere else. Being human means to be a perpetual time traveler, caught flying between the past and the future, but never in the present moment, what we like to call the eternal instant. As a result, one of the things that happens is we're never conscious in any given moment, but live in a constant state of daydreaming. We find ourselves constantly fantasizing, daydreaming, uh, worrying, planning, plotting, whatever you want to call it. And we've all caught ourselves doing this before. We've all been so not paying attention that we've had an accident. We've tripped over something we didn't see. We walked into a telephone pole on the street. We've all done that thing where you've got something on your mind and you're driving somewhere or to reach your destination and realize, what? I'm here already? I don't even remember half of that drive. And unfortunately, that's through how a vast number of car accidents occur. People are behind the wheel physically, but their mind is not behind the wheel. It's somewhere else. A lot of the accidents and silly things that we do in life is a result of this. 
is a result of that fact that we're constantly daydreaming. Our conscious isn't consciousness story isn't there in a present moment. It's kind of living in the past, reliving memories and old experiences, or it's projecting itself into the future, trying to plan, predict, all that kind of stuff. As a result, what we tend to say is our consciousness is asleep. And that's one of the strange things about being human, is we're asleep but firmly believe that we're awake. When we go to sleep at night, everyone's familiar with the dreams and things that we experience. But when we wake up, all that stuff is still there. It's just happening at a different level. Okay, so the strange irony of being a human is we're asleep yet firmly believe that we're awake. And that's why when you see different spiritual schools or spiritual paths talking about this, they always talk about an awakening, an awakening of the consciousness. If it's asleep, then in order to, to uh, develop consciousness, we have to change that state. Okay? We have to awaken the consciousness, the consciousness that's always caught up in the past or in the future, but is never here in the present moment. It's never in that eternal instant. We're always somewhere else in our life. One of the things that we seek to do on this path is awaken and develop that consciousness. Okay, That divine spark that we carry inside all of us, that part of the greater whole, that's like a seed that we want to transform into a mighty tree. But the problem is, by never being in the present moment, we've forgotten all about that seed. We don't nurture that seed. We don't feed it. We don't give it any water. We don't give it any light. So that seed never grows. So we're born and we die the entire time carrying that seed, the potential for something much greater inside of us. But because we're never in the present moment, because we're never here now, because we're always caught up in the future and the past with these endless trains of thoughts and reactions and distractions, we've forgotten all about the seed that we carry with us. But we can change that. By working on various aspects of our psychology, we can learn to, you know, a catchphrase for you, live in the present moment, you know, be in the now, okay, which is what the, the whole concept of the, the, the uh, Chinese Tao is about, living in the present moment, being in the now. Because the now, the internal instant, that's where the consciousness lives. By understanding various elements of our psychology and working with various practical techniques, we can learn to develop that consciousness. We can learn to take that seed and water it and feed it and give it light to make that seed start to grow, to develop that consciousness, that spiritual aspect, that divine spark that we carry within all of us. When we go a bit further, when we talk about uh, Gnosis, well, Gnosis gives us the path, the knowledge, and the practices necessary to awaken consciousness here and now, not three, four lifetimes from now, but here and now in the present moment. So it's, it's, a, it's a path to a certain extent, it's knowledge, but more importantly, it's practices. Because in the end, knowledge through experience. To experience, we have to practice. It's various techniques that we use, everything from meditation to various tools to examine our own psychology. The whole purpose is to awaken that consciousness, to develop the spiritual side of ourselves, to nurture that divine spark that we find in all of us. Gnosis also, when we start working with our own psychology, it gives us the tools to eliminate the negative aspects of ourselves and the suffering that we cause. We find that we waste a lot of time and a lot of energy on things like fear, things like depression, things like anger, guilt, all that kind of stuff. These become chains that keep us bound to this physical plane. These are weights that we drag around everywhere. By working with some of the tools that we do in Gnosis, and particularly some of the practices and the experiences that they lead to, that gives us a whole way to eliminate some of that negative stuff, to cut those chains, to, to cut the ties that bind us to this physical plane. When we look at where Gnosis comes from, because like I said, Gnosis really isn't a religion. People always say, well, is this some kind of religion? Gnosis on its own isn't really religion. A good way of thinking of this is Gnosis is the distillation of knowledge from all the great civilizations. So you think of the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Indians, the Tibetans, the Nordics, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Persians, the First Nations, whatever. If you think of all those great civilizations, Gnosis simply becomes the knowledge. Because remember the root, the entomology behind Gnosis is simply wisdom. And if we took all the world's religions, you just name a religion, Buddhist, Hindu, Greek, Jewish, Muslim, whatever, if you put all the world's religions all the world's cultures, civilizations, imagine you put them in a blender and you mashed them all together and you distilled that. What you would get, that distillate, would be 
the Gnosis, okay, the original wisdom. Because when we study all these world's religions, what we see are the same stories told over and over, again and again. All these different religions were just the Gnosis, the original wisdom, expressed in a different form. Or religion was just an expression of that wisdom to suit a particular culture in a particular geographic location at a particular time period. The principles and foundations of Gnosis can be found in and become the common thread behind thousands of years of civilization and religion. Okay, Gnosis simply means wisdom. That original wisdom is always there. It just changes. It changes because it has to change to suit a particular people in a particular time period, in a particular location. It changes to suit cultures, but the Gnosis itself, that wisdom, never changes. It's always there. It underpins all the world's great religions. It's the common thread we find behind thousands of years of civilization and religion. So to study Gnosis is almost a, a comparative uh, religious study to a certain extent. And you'll find that there's many aspects during this uh, program as we explore the different Gnostic concepts where what we'll do is we'll look at something that you know happened in Greek mythology and then we'll find that that's similar to something in Christianity which is similar to something in Judaism and then we'll find a reflection of that today so oftentimes when we study Gnosis we start to pick apart these common threads one of the more interesting aspects of Gnosis is the more you study it the more you start to see it everywhere around you these great truths, these original wisdoms, they haven't been hidden. They haven't been only given out in secret societies. They've been in plain view all along. The more you start to study Gnosis and get to some of these common threads, these themes that underpin all the great religions, next thing you know, you start seeing these truths everywhere. You start seeing them in fairy tales. You start seeing them in Walt Disney cartoons, believe it or not. Everywhere you look, you see these things, these wisdoms, these stories that have been told again and again and again, because the Gnosis, it's always been there. It's never gone anywhere. All religions are born and die within time, but the values, the truth, which underpins all the great religions remains. That is the Gnosis. So great civilizations rise and fall. Great religions rise and fall. Everything changes to suit the times, the people, and the climate, the location, but what underpins all of it, the Gnosis, the wisdom, that never changes. That just reemerges in a different expression, in a different location, for a different people, for a different time period. Let's have a look at some common themes. For example, when we talk about the Divine Mother, most people think of you know, the Virgin Mary. Uh, Isis was another example. Uh, Shakti itself from the, the, the Hindu was another example. There's lots of different expressions of this. You know, Gaia, Maya, uh, Rhea, uh, we see the Venus, Aphrodite. There's always an expression in every religion for the Divine Mother. Now, the Divine Mother is usually a really interesting person because the Divine Mother gives birth to somebody really special. The Divine Mother gives birth to the solar hero. Jesus is an example of a solar hero, as is uh, Osiris, as is even Buddha. Now, these individuals, they're always born to the Divine Mother. The situation of their birth is usually unusual. There's something very special about the situation of their birth. Uh, the Divine Mother is always closely related to nature as well, the whole feminine creative aspect of everything that we see around us. Now, when we look at the solar heroes, every culture has its solar hero. Hercules was a solar hero, for example. The lives of many of these solar heroes are remarkably similar as well. Let's take the story of Jesus, which everybody knows, and the story of Osiris, which not a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, these guys are separated by more than 2,000 years old, okay, or 2,000 years. Uh, Jesus died and resurrected. Well, Osiris died and resurrected too. Jesus born to a virgin, mo virgin mother. Well, so was Osiris. He was born to a virgin mother too. Jesus, when he was dead, he was crucified on a cross. Well, he wasn't crucified on a cross, but when he was dead, he was chopped into four chunks and thrown to the four corners of the earth, which is another form of cross, right? So when we start comparing the lives of the solar heroes, we see a lot of the same things happening over and over again. They always have to fight some sort of a great monster, some sort of a demon or a dragon that tries to tempt them. They always end up going down to hell and having to come back again. There's a lot of great uh, themes that we see repeated over and over again in the world's religions. So when we take a Gnostic approach to this, we say, okay, that story that's told over and over again, the story of birth and death and resurrection, what does that mean for us today? What can we distill? What can we extract from that? 
Because why is that story told again and again and again? What is there for us? What can we take from that story? That truth, that gnosis that's there, how can we extract that and how can we apply it to our lives? How can we use that knowledge to bring ourselves closer to the source of all things, to cultivate and develop that divine spark in all of us? Now, the goal of modern gnosis is simply the awakening of consciousness, one of those things that's easier done. And by awakening of consciousness, I'm talking about self-realization of our true being, the whole concept of liberation, freeing ourselves from all this material stuff around us, and instead developing that spiritual aspect, developing that, that seed, that divine spark within us. We all carry the potential to be something much greater than we are. We as individuals, we are humans, you know, what's the meaning of life? We've been taken from somewhere and we've been planted. We're like a seed that's been planted in the ground. What we have to do is learn to nurture that seed. We have to learn to, how to water it, how to, how to feed it, how to give it light, so that seed can grow and transform itself. That's what it is to be human. We all carry the spark of something inside of us, but it's like unrealized potential. Through the study of Gnosis, through the study of our own psychology, through the study of meditation and things like that, we work towards the awakening of that consciousness. We work towards cultivating that divine spark, that essence of the divine that we carry within us. Self-realization of who we really are, discovering our untapped potential, what we were put here for. Modern Gnosis is founded on what we call the four pillars of knowledge. And to study Gnosis, is to look at these four pillars, is to understand these four different elements. The first pillar that we look at, actually here's an interesting temple, this is an old ruined temple from Greece, and you can see the front of this temple has four pillars. That was a, a common theme we see in a lot of religious architecture. Sorry? I've been there. You've been there? Oh, there you go. He's been there, see? <laughs> yeah, there we go looking at the, the four pillars of knowledge, and this is a, a common theme. The number four has great significance that we'll be looking at at various points as we explore this course. The first pillar is philosophy. If we're going to be talking about anything to do with a spiritual path, at some point we're going to be examining philosophy. Philosophy simply being the search for knowledge, the nature and meaning of our existence. So to study Gnosis, to some extent, at various points along the path, we become philosophers. We talk about those sort of concepts. We study some of the work of the world's great philosophers in an attempt to search for the nature and the meaning of our existence. The other big pillar that we find is science. To walk the Gnostic path is to become an esoteric scientist. We study things like astronomy, you know, various planets and arrangements and that kind of stuff. We study vibration, a lot of the laws of nature. We study various aspects of medicine. We talk about things like quantum physics and other dimensions and that kind of stuff. We talk about alchemy. We talk about uh, uh, Jewish Kabbalah, the science of numbers. So to walk the Gnostic path, we're not only philosophers, we're also esoteric scientists as well. The obvious one, if we're going to walk this path, we're going to have to study the religion. We Kind of like what we just did, looking at the Divine Mother and the Solar Hero. We spend a lot of time studying the world's religions. We study the stories, the writings, the fables, the nursery rhymes, the parables, all that stuff that's been handed down across thousands of years. We study all that kind of stuff to find those common threads to find that gnosis and then interpret what that means to our lives right now. And the fourth pillar is the pillar of art. To study gnosis, we have to study art because we're going to find all kinds of symbolism and hidden truth in various works of art. Art is another way that the gnosis expresses itself. For example, we study visual art. You know, the, the things people like da Vinci, Michelangelo, everybody thinks of the Mona Lisa, of course, right? That's interesting because the Mona Lisa is an expression of the Divine Mother. And there's all kinds of interesting things in that, that picture that we can use to find out information about uh, the, the, um, the Divine Mother. Same thing with the Last Supper. There's another famous painting which has all kinds of Gnostic symbolism in it. Um, obviously there's Mona Lisa right there. And here's another interesting symbol as well. We've all seen this one before. Um, the, the connection of, of God and, and man and that kind of stuff. A lot of these great artists uh, people like da Vinci, they, they were masters. They were people that had an awakened consciousness. They had developed that spiritual aspect within themselves. Consequently, they were capable of, of translating that gnosis into different expressions. 
One of the reasons why this picture is so captivating and one of the reasons why there's so much mystery surrounding that picture is because that's da Vinci's expression of the Divine Mother, the feminine creative aspect that expresses itself through all of us. And by studying these great works, we can learn about the Gnosis. We can learn about things in our own psychology from great works of art such as this. But when we talk about art, we're not just talking about paintings and sculpture and that kind of stuff. We're also talking architecture. Things like the pyramids, things like Stonehenge, Easter Island, all this stuff was built for a purpose and contains all kinds of Gnostic information. It's just different expressions of these truths. These people didn't make these giant structures that would last a thousand or thousands of years because they were bored. There was all kinds of information contained in the arrangements of these objects and how these stones are placed and what these things are and why they have eyes and why they're looking out to the sea. And what does it mean that all around Easter Island all those statues are pictured facing the water? There's all kinds of symbolism behind that. And to study a lot of the ancient architecture, there's all kinds of truths that we can extract out of that that are relevant to our lives here and now. Not only visual art, not only architecture, but also dramatic arts. Plays or operas like Wagner's Parseval and Mozart's Magic Flute, believe it or not, even these guys, Wagner and Mozart, they were awakened masters. They had their consciousness awakened. They had that divine spark within them cultivated and developed to a great extent. That's why they were able to write such beautiful music, which can't even be replicated today. That's why when we see a lot of their operatic works, like Parsifal, which is all about the Holy Grail, basically, and the Magic Flute, which is all a, basically a Masonic initiation ceremony, there's all kinds of symbolism. The story of the Magic Flute is the story of the battle between light and dark within us. It's all about the awakening of consciousness. To anybody else, it's just a really interesting play. It's just a really nice opera. But when we look at it with a Gnostic lens, when we put it under the Gnostic microscope, we discover tons of symbolism that's relevant to our lives here and now. Because that's what it was intended to be. This was an awakened master that had put all that stuff in there, put that symbolism in there intentionally. Not only dramatic arts, but also music itself. We look at various aspects of classical music. For example, Beethoven was another awakened master. The music that he wrote came from somewhere else. It came from the higher dimensions. He was able to actually bring that music down to this level. When we look at, say, uh, uh, Indian ragas, which is what most people would associate with uh, basically sitars and tablas, these were songs that were 20 minutes long, but they were an expression of something else. It wasn't like, you know, modern music that you'd hear on the radio. These were songs that were written for religious reasons, songs that were intended to bring about a change in consciousness of the listener. Same thing with Tibetan mantras and chanting, if you've ever heard those before. These weren't people singing because they were bored or because they were happy. These were very specific musical works that were intended through the use of sound to bring out a different state of vibration. And that different state of vibration was meant to bring about a different change in our consciousness. Listening to this music was an attempt to help the listener elevate to a different level spiritually. So we look at philosophy, we look at science, we even look at art, and of course the other fourth one is religion as well. When we look at studying Gnosis, people always say, well, you know, what do I need to be able to do to study Gnosis? Like, what, what do I have to do here? Well, the first thing we'll mention is Gnosis isn't a religion, as I said earlier. Consequently, Gnosis doesn't require you to abandon whatever religious or spiritual beliefs you have right now. Okay? It can actually do the opposite. Gnosis embraces all faiths, is a saying that all rivers flow to the ocean, right? All those different forms of religious expression, all those different spiritual or religious paths, they were just an expression of the Gnosis, as I mentioned earlier, in a different form for a different culture in a different location. Gnosis embraces all faiths, recognizing they all stem from the same source. They're all expressions of the same principle. So it's not like, well, to be Gnosis, so you can't go to church, you can't be Christian, you can't be Jewish, you're going to have to renounce your faith or something like that. Gnosis itself isn't a religion, therefore it doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter what you believe in. In the end, whatever you believe in is just an expression of the same source. Now, interestingly enough, you don't have to abandon your religious beliefs. And curiously enough, Gnosis can strengthen whatever faith you have by unveiling the origins. Gnosis, the, through the study of Gnosis, we start to recognize that all religions are just expression of the same principles. In the end, you think of all the thousands of 
of years of fighting on this planet, all the countless millions of deaths as a result of religious differences. But in the end, you know what? It's all the same anyways. To be fighting you whether you're Muslim or Christian or whatever, it doesn't matter because it's all the same thing. And that can be strengthened and reinforced when we study Gnosis and we look at the different religions and we find some of those common threads, we can go, huh, you know what, it really is all the same anyways. So in the end, whatever faith you have, be it Jewish, be it Muslim, uh, be it Christian, you can have that faith strengthened through the study of Gnosis once you start to realize where some of these religions came from. Once you start to understand some of the teachings from a different level, once you start to see these common threads and this universal principle express itself. Gnosis, this is an interesting one as well, I really like this one. Gnosis doesn't require you to retreat from everyday life and live in a cave. A lot of spiritual schools, you basically, you know, to do this properly, you have to give it all up, right? Quit your job and leave your family and sell everything you own and wander around and nothing but, you know, rags and live in a cave and that kind of stuff. Gnosis is the exact opposite of that. There's no need to abandon civic and family responsibilities to study Gnosis. Everything that happens in our life happens for a reason. Every situation we find ourselves in is an opportunity to perfect ourselves. And Gnosis says, you know what, you can't run and go hide in a cave because that's not going to allow you to perfect yourself. For example, let's say I have a problem with anger. Let's say I'm someone that people would say has a really short fuse and have a violent temper and that kind of stuff. That anger is usually a reaction to other people. Now let's say to escape that anger, I run and I say, I've had enough, I'm going to go live in a cave. So I go live in a cave for 20 years, and I never see another human person. And I decide for 20 years, you know what, I haven't been angry in 20 years. Just, I think it's time to leave the cave. I think I'm going to leave the cave, a success, I finally beat the anger, and I'm going to go join civilization. And I leave my cave, and the second I step foot out of my cave, somebody almost runs me over in a car. And of course, then I shoot him in the middle finger salute and start swearing at him. In the end, that anger didn't go anywhere. Okay? We all have a purpose in life. Everything that happens to us, the circumstances of our life, from our family to our job to our economic situation, all that stuff is all meant to teach us something. Everything that happens to us in life, the good and the bad, is an opportunity to develop ourselves spiritually. That's why we're here. That's why we were born into the situations and circumstances we were born into. That's why the things that happen to us do. They're all an opportunity to learn and perfect oneself. And one of the really nice parts about Gnosis is we can learn to take the negative things that happen in our lives. We can learn to take those times that we're afraid or angry or depressed. And we can learn to turn them around and use those situations as a lens to study our own psychology. It all goes back to Nosite Ipsum, know thyself. We can use the opportunity we have where we're angry at somebody at work we can use that as a way to study the manifestation of anger within ourselves and work towards its elimination. Not simply hiding from the circumstances of life, not avoiding the circumstances of life, but using the circumstances of life as a tool to nurture and develop that spiritual side of ourselves. Gnosis recognizes the importance of life, everyday life, all the stuff that we have, have happened to us, we recognize that as an ability to provide valuable tools to learn about our own psychology. So Gnosis is not about avoiding things and avoiding people and getting rid of our job and our, selling all our stuff and running away from it all. Gnosis is about experiencing life directly, using every situation in life as an opportunity to learn about our own psychology, to develop and nurture that divine spark that we all carry within. Gnosis doesn't require you to believe anything either. This isn't, uh, what would you use, the, this isn't like a faith-based thing. This isn't, uh, you know, trust me, believe me, that kind of thing. Gnosis is entirely different. Gnosis encourages us to practice and experience first-hand the knowledge. Right? Gnosite ipsum, know thyself, wisdom as knowledge through experience. Gnosis is all about techniques, tools, practices that we use to arrive firsthand at the knowledge. So when we're talking about astral projection, which is a thing that usually gets people excited, we're not talking about, you're not listening to me tell you what astral projection, I tell you what the astral plane, and tell you all the things that I've done. Instead, we look at the tools, the techniques, the practices that we need in order to develop that faculty for ourselves. Awakening consciousness within dreams, promoting lucid dreaming, 
met different states of meditation. It's not simply talking about it. It's not simply listening to somebody else tell you all about it and then tell you why you couldn't possibly experience these things. Because I'm up here and you're down here. You possibly. It's not like that. What it is, it's a system where we give you the tools and the practices necessary for you to experience firsthand yourself. Those who walk the Gnostic path have studied, tested, experienced, and confirmed the teachings. I'm standing here talking about this stuff because once I was like you, coming to a Gnostic class going, I don't know, let's see what this is about. Seems kind of interesting. Stuck around for a while. A lot of practices, a lot of techniques. You know what? I tried them. You know what happened? They worked. And that's why I'm still here. And the Gnostic path is like that. Everybody who's walked the Gnostic path for an extent of time has experienced things directly. Okay, so when we talk about astral projection, it's not, you know, me telling you stuff that you'll never know. It's me saying, this is how you do it. Now you go do it and you figure out everything you need to know about the astral plane. Okay, same with meditation. You want to know what's meditation like? What will show you techniques for you to experience deep states of meditation? Okay, for you to turn off all your thoughts and experience the illuminated void and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so in the end, it's all about a practical path. It's about experiencing firsthand the, the teachings. Okay, and learning how to in integrate those teachings into our own lives. Gnosis doesn't require you to put your trust in another person and rely only on the word and experiences of others. And that's a real trap that we see when we start looking at different religious or spiritual movements. There's always somebody who's more special than you for whatever reason, because they're higher or better somehow, and you have to rely on that person. Okay? We see basically a hierarchy in a lot of religious institutions. The most famous hierarchy is obviously probably when we look at Catholicism and the idea of popes and bishops and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing like that in Gnosis, because Gnosis is simply the search for the truth, and it's all knowledge through experience. So you know what? You don't have to trust anything I say. Don't take my word for absolutely any of it. You figure it out for yourself. Okay, if you want to know about astral projection, I can tell you some stuff, but in the end, you know what? So, it doesn't mean anything what I tell you. Okay, in the end, practice the techniques yourself and experience firsthand what it's like to go to the astral plane, to awaken consciousness at that level, to interact with the intelligences and the, the, the beings and things that reside at that particular level. Okay, through Gnosis, one can receive knowledge firsthand directly from the masters, the divinities, the gods, the angels, that kind of stuff. Just like a whoa, really strange thing to say. You know what a, an angel or a, a god or a deva is? It's simply an intelligence that resides at a different level. Okay, these are just the people, the intelligences that live in the different dimensions. Okay, the idea being that what are you saying that there's different dimensions and that we're, we can somehow occupy different dimensions at the same time? You're already occupying three dimensions simultaneously, length, width, and height. And on top of that, you're actually occupying a fourth dimension because as you're sitting there with length, width, and height, the fourth dimension of time is flowing through the space. So sitting in that chair right now, you're simultaneously occupying four dimensions. Why do you think it stops there? When the ancient religions looked up to the higher dimensions, they saw how you know, different they were from the physical dimensions, and they gave them names. They called them heavens. They called them paradises. Okay? Whether you want to get all quantum physics and talk about parallel dimensions and all that kind of stuff, it's all the same thing. There's different dimensions above us and there's different dimensions below us. The dimensions that exist below us, when the ancient people looked down there, they said, wow, these aren't really nice places. There's a lot of negative stuff happens in the lower dimensions. And the lower dimensions just became the various hells. The Hades, the Tartarus, the Avicis, they just became the lower regions of existence. Okay? We're simultaneously occupying multiple dimensions right now. But for some reason, the this, the idea that there could be more dimensions seems really unusual, but we're already simultaneously occupying four. But while you're sitting there, you're also occupying a fifth as well. You're just not familiar with that fifth aspect. Okay, the different dimensions, it's kind of like, uh, I'll just give you a little an analogy. It's kind of like right now in this room, there's hundreds of radio stations flying through the air. But the ro radio station we'd hear is the one that the radio would be tuned to, right? Now, if we tune that radio to another station, we'd be able to hear what was happening on that station as well. We all have those tuners inside our bodies. We just forgot that they're there or how to use them. The idea of being able to perceive the different dimensions is just learning how to access that tuner and tune in to what's already there. All the dimensions interpenetrate themselves. They're all here right now around us simultaneously. It's just we're only tuned in to the three dimensions that we see in front of us. 
Okay, but with practices and techniques, we can learn how to tune into the different dimensions. Okay, that's something that happens every night when you fall asleep. If I said, you know, who's astral projected before, you really all have to put your hands up. Because every night when you go to sleep, that's what you do. And you're in the astral world when you're having your dreams, and your dreams are actually astral experiences. And we'll look at that later on, and we'll look at how to awaken consciousness within a dream, also known as lucid dreaming. Okay, and we'll look at using lucid dreaming as a launch point for having uh, legitimate astral experiences. But when we go to the astral world, you know what? There's intelligences there. There's people there. There's things that we can talk to that can tell us things about the mysteries of life and death and our purpose and all that kind of stuff. When the ancient people talked to them, they said that they were angels. They were the gods and goddesses of the various religions. Okay, so we can experience firsthand directly what it's like to communicate with those intelligences, those masters, those divinities that reside in the higher dimensions. Gnosis doesn't require you to accept an external god. We don't, you know, worship anything or bow down to any kind of idol or anything else like that. But instead, we communicate and be guided by the inner divinity that lives inside all of us. To follow Gnosis is to follow the god that we find within, because we all have that spark. Right? We all have that piece of the divine, that piece of the great source that we came from. What we do with Gnosis is we learn to recognize and develop that aspect and use that as our guide. Okay? So in Gnosis, what guides us? The divinity that we find inside of ourselves. That's what we use as our guiding principle. That's what we use as our lighthouse or our beacon. Not somebody else, not me, not him, not anybody else, but the divinity that we find inside ourselves. That's why it's so important. That's why the Greeks said, Nasa te ipsum, know thyself, because there's something inside you that has all the answers. There's something inside you that we can use as the guide. We just have to learn to listen to that inner voice. The problem being, remember earlier we talked about those 30 to 40,000 thoughts a day? We can't even hear that inner voice because it's washed out by all that noise. Imagine going into a room and in a, in a big room there's a small child in the corner. And that small child represents your unrealized potential, the inner divinity that we all carry within. But imagine, in addition to that small child in the room, there's a hundred other people screaming for your attention. Those hundred other people represent the different thoughts, the different emotions that fly through your mind each day. Through meditation, we can shut all those other people off so we can focus on what that small child is saying. That's part of this path is trying to cultivate our inner divinity, how to get rid of all those distractions, all those things that hold us back, and learn how to communicate directly with the inner divinity that we carry within. Uh, an interesting aspect of Gnosis is uh, remembering if you saw speak at the library, Gnosis doesn't require that you pay any money or buy your way into higher levels of knowledge. The Gnosis is it's always been delivered at no cost because it's wisdom. Wisdom is a commodity that can neither be bought nor sold. So it doesn't matter if you had a million dollars to pay, that's still not going to do anything for you. Okay? Gnosis has always been given freely, and that's part of the whole process of the, the dissemination of the Gnosis. Um, another thing to, to think about talking about this point right here is in the end, uh, one of the principles that guides Gnosis is he who helps himself helps others. Okay? If I wish to receive knowledge and experiences on this path, then I have to work so others can receive knowledge and experience as well. And the whole consequence is that is that we don't charge money for the teachings. We never charge money for the teachings. And speaking of charging money for the teachings, it's kind of funny that when you tell people it's for free, that they look at you all suspect and suspicious. But people would gladly sign up for workshops for weekends that are worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars with promises of awakening consciousness and meditation and awakening kundalini and all this other stuff. In the end, it comes down to your practice and your experience. So consequently, you can't buy that. You can't buy experience for yourself. You can't buy practices for yourself. It comes down to what you do. To start the study of Gnosis, then, all you really need is patience, tenacity, perseverance, and willpower. This path is not for those who expect immediate results. And unfortunately, one of the aspects of our society right now is we're an instant gratification society, and it's becoming worse and worse every day. And with each generation of, of new people that comes into the world, they're getting really bad at this. Everything has to happen now and instantly. Okay? The Gnostic path isn't like that. Um, if we want to do something, I'll keep using the, the uh, example of astral projection. If we want to learn to astral project, you know what? That's going to take you longer than a couple of times before you get the hang of it. Okay? It's something else that requires practice. I would think of Gnosis right now as you are about to learn an instrument. Let's not pretend this is Gnosis. Let's pretend this is your first piano lesson. 
or your first guitar lesson. If this is your first piano lesson, would you expect by um, this time come November you'd be able to play the full catalog of Beethoven on piano? Of course not. You'd still be trying to figure out how you make a chord after a couple of months. How good you are within a few months depends on, well, how much practice have you been doing? If you go to piano lessons once a week and you don't touch a piano in between, then you're probably not going to be very good at piano. Okay, it's going to take you longer to get to the goal that you're seeking. But if you go for piano lessons once a week and then practice a little bit every day, come the next week, you're going to be a lot better. Notice this is exactly like that. Because this is a practical path, patience, tenacity, perseverance, and willpower, these are things that we need. Okay, good things come to those who wait, and what you put in is what you can expect to get out. And interestingly enough, I've talked to all kinds of students at various levels, and I've seen people that, you know, come and go, and I've seen people that stay with it, and interesting enough, the last class that we did, there was an individual that came out for a couple of months and, you know, tried various practices, and then one day I got this really excited email from him at work uh, one morning, because that night he finally had a su success with astral projection. He finally had his astral projection breakthrough, and it finally worked for him. But he had to practice up until that point. I remember once, uh, years ago, having an individual that, uh, you know, stayed for a while and said, ah, well, I tried out projecting like two or three times and it didn't work, so obviously this isn't for me. And I went, yeah, apparently it's not. Because <laughs> if you expected something that quick, then no. Okay, the awakening of consciousness that we have inside us, that's a slow process. It's just like an acorn growing into an oak tree. You don't plant an acorn, come on the next day and go, whoa, that's a nice oak tree, that's huge. But you watch that tree slowly grow and develop, getting bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually it reaches that goal. Spiritual awakening is the same thing. It's like that seed that grows into a tree. Okay? It's a process. It takes time and it takes work. You've got to water the tree. You've got to make sure during the summer that it you know, doesn't dry out. You've got to get all the weeds around it. You've got to trim the stuff around it so it's constantly got enough light. It's the same idea when we look at the divine side of ourselves. It's something we have to work on, and it's something that's not going to happen overnight. If we're looking for instant results and quick gratification, we're not going to find that here. We're actually not going to find that anywhere as far as anything spiritual. That's why people like money, I think, because they like to buy stuff. Because if I spend like $500 on some sort of workshop or some sort of course, it's that instant gratification thing. I put out this much money, therefore I will get something back. But in the end, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the joke's always on you because all you get is the techniques and the stuff that you're expected to practice. And then because of that, you can't bother to stick with the practices. So because you don't stick with the practices, nothing happens, so you go somewhere else. Now, maybe this is the right path, or this is the right school. And that seems like a lot of effort. Oh, this one over here. Next thing you know, we spend our entire life jumping from school to school to school to school. Where if we just settled down with any one of them and just did the work and just put the time in, that would have led to the results. All you know, rivers lead to the ocean, but you kind of have to get on the river and let it take you somewhere. It doesn't help to keep jumping from river to river to river. The other thing that we need that becomes a valuable tool in the study of Gnosis is an open mind. We have to accept that we are not perfect. We have many errors. There's many aspects about our psychology that hold us back, that impede our progress. To study Gnosis is to stand there in front of a full-length mirror. You have to be prepared to accept the reflection that comes back. If man is, or humanity as a whole, is guilty of worshipping any false idol, it's the false idol of the self. We love to put ourselves up on a pedestal. If we bow down to any golden idols every day, it is the golden idol image of the self. We spend more time criticizing and condemning actions in other people that we readily excuse in ourselves on a daily basis. Okay, we're all narcissistic to a certain extent. We all love ourselves. Okay, part of the process of gnosis is to find those negative aspects that are keeping us bound to this three-dimensional plane and learn how to sever those ties so we can develop that spiritual aspect. Okay, we want to water and nurture that seed, but we first have to get the weeds out of the garden. And to be human means to have a lot of weeds. We've got to go in and do some weeding before we can develop that spiritual aspect. But that's a difficult thing to do because a lot of people would like to, to live in the, the you know, false world of accepting, well, I, I, I'm perfect. You guys might have problems. I'm sure you've all got problems. Look at you guys. You guys all got problems. Not me. <laughs> this, this, when you talk about problems, you can be talking about other people because not me. We have a real tendency to do that as, human, as humans. And you can catch yourselves doing that all the time. 
uh, one of the interesting experiences, the first time I kind of realized some of this stuff going years ago just in my own psychology, I remember uh, uh, waiting at a red light to turn and other people were running a red light, you know, which is common in London, right? People making left turns, you get about six cars through that, but the light turns red so you don't get to go. And I remember like being all, you know, all annoyed and angry at these people and reacting to their actions. Uh, and then at the next intersection, I guess who ran through the red light to make a left-hand turn? But see, it was different, because I had somewhere to go, and I was in a hurry, you know what I mean? Because, you know, I'm sure that, you know, I had an excuse, right? <laughs> we do that all the time. We're always condemning and criticizing behavior in other people that we readily excuse in ourselves, okay? Ironically, if we took the time that we condemn, judge, criticize, and analyze the behavior of others, if we directed that internally, condemned, criticized, analyzed, and judged our own behavior, the world would be an entirely different place. It really would be a paradise, heaven on earth, so to speak. Because if we all did that, we'd all be developing our own consciousness. We'd all be weeding our own garden, allowing that seed to really grow and take off. That's another really important aspect of this path as well. If we tend to think that we're perfect and everybody else is the problem, then we might have some challenges to face on this path. One of the most important things, and the thing that I bet you everyone here has already, we talked a little bit about this earlier, is that inner urge to change and find the meaning behind life. That push. That push comes from that divine spark within us. Part of the path of Gnosis is to get to know firsthand where that urge comes from. Okay, To really identify with that divine spark in us, to get to know firsthand that part inside of us that has been pushing us for this path this entire life and the lives that we've had before that. That's something else we'll study as well. This is not your first life. Okay, We've had many lives on this planet and each time we've always had that push, that drive towards seeking things of a spiritual nature, that looking at life and saying, this is all fine, but I think there's something else. There's something else here. There's something else more important. There's something else I have to figure out. That's one of the most indispensable tools because that change, that push, comes from that divine spark within us. And to walk the Gnostic path is to get to know, strengthen, and cultivate that divine spark that we have within. To make a connection to that source which is pushing us, existence after existence, lifetime after lifetime, to go back to that source, to reunite ourselves with the divine, the great ocean, the giant beach, however you want to think about it. Gnosis simply becomes a journey of self-discovery and revelation. When we change the way we look at ourselves, we change the way we look at the world. When we understand how to properly relate to ourselves, then we can properly relate to our fellow man. To study our own psychology allows us to improve the relationships we have with friends, with family, with significant others, with co-workers. We change the way we look at the world, we look at nature, we look at everything around us and our place in it. Why do we call it the path of the razor's edge? Imagine walking on a razor. Really narrow. You can easily fall off to the left. You can easily fall to the right. It would take a lot of concentration and balance to walk along the edge of that razor blade. That's the same thing to study the path of knowledge, or sorry, the path of the razor's edge that leads to the experience of the truth. What do you want to call truth? You could call it God. You could call it Allah. You could call it Brahma. You, whatever you want. It's all the same thing. To discover the truth is to merge ourselves back with the source of all things. Back to that great energy source. You can call it whatever you're comfortable calling it. Any questions? Okay, we always do a practical bit at the end. So what we'll do now is we'll take a, 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 just a quick five minute break to stretch your legs so you can 